to thank you for joining us this morning for a discussion about affirmative action. The immediate context of this discussion is, of course, that Proposition 16 uh, is on the ballot next month in California. And Proposition 16 is an attempt to reverse the ban on affirmative action, which has been in place in California since 1996, when Prop 209 was passed. So, you know, someone had put a, a question in chat about what's the recommended action. Uh, the action is that we want to vote yes on Prop 16, which will bring back uh, affirmative action to California. All right, uh, but I'm sure uh, Dr. Vasquez Heilig is going to address affirmative action and, and situation in California and also Prop 16 uh, in his talk. So uh, let me briefly introduce uh, Dr. Vasquez Heilig. Um, please join me to uh, welcome him on behalf of AKSC. Uh, we appreciate really uh, Dr. Vasquez Heilig taking the time to join us today. I'm going to provide a very, very brief um, summary of, the, of uh, Dr. Vasquez Heilig's work. Uh, he is currently uh, the Dean at the University of Kentucky's College of Education. And he's an award-winning leader, teacher, and researcher, and a dynamic voice for equity in education in the US and around the world. He is familiar with the social and uh, political context in California, having lived and worked here for a number of years. Prior to teaching at the University of Kentucky, he was at the California State University, Sacramento, where he was a professor of education leadership and policy studies, and also director of the doctorate in education leadership program. He also went to school in the Bay Area, having received his PhD and master's degrees, both from uh, Stanford University. So Dr. Vasquez Heilig's work in higher education looks at educational policy in the context of civil rights and social justice, and is specifically centered on issues of how to achieve equity and the importance of inclusion and diversity. His research focuses on uh, issues of equity education, specifically in relation to access for African-American students and Latinx students, and the question of choice, what does choice mean in, in relationship to the importance of preserving public education? His work to improve access and success for historically underrepresented students through approaches that are community engaged, innovative, equity minded, and transformative. His scholarly work has been accompanied by interventions into policy discussions at various levels, including the legislative. Uh, he's currently working on a new civil rights and education collaboration between the University of Kentucky's College of Education and the NAACP. He contributes to a blog focused on education and social justice, and it's called uh, Cloaking Iniquity, where you can also learn about his scholarly work uh, as well as his uh, you know, um, policy interventions. He's also on Twitter at, uh, as at Professor Jamie H., and um, one of us will drop a link in the chat which has more information about Professor Vasquez Hilig. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vasquez Hilig. Hil Hilig. I'm so sorry. Um, um, thank you for joining us today. So glad to join you all. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the cool things about uh, attending a diverse university are uh, the diverse friends and diverse curriculum and diverse experiences uh, that you can have, which I think is at the core of some of these conversations about education. Um, I had never been to a Diwali show until uh, I went to the University of Michigan, and some of my friends uh, that were from uh, that were Gujarati invited me to go. Um, I didn't know about uh, the interaction between Martin Luther King's um ideas and and gandhi's india until i took a course at the university of michigan uh, about those sort of overlapping uh, concepts and to me that's what higher education higher education is really about uh is those those kinds of of interactions and opportunities between uh different communities um uh and 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 so i'm just so excited to join you today i'm going to talk about some of my research um, and, and you had talked about the setting, uh, 
Um, I, I want to talk about the context and the setting within which students live in California, too. I think that is a really important part of this conversation to understand uh, what's happening in various communities uh, in California. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about setting. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about my research. And some of it, you know, spans different areas, but I think it all points us uh, in 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 a certain direction. So, um, um, I, I and I've prepared some slides. So I'm going to uh, try to share my my screen here. Um, and as I'm doing that, you know, I was uh, in California, and um, I'm trying to figure out how to share my screen. Um, start share. So I was in California uh, as education chair of the California NAACP when some of these conversations began about Proposition 209 and the impacts that it's had on education and, and, and other things um, uh, in the state. And if, if you think back, there, there are a set of libertarians, um, neoliberals, so to say, uh, that have been very focused on ignoring uh, the impact that race and culture have in our society. We live in a society uh, that is full of different types of macro and micro aggressions towards uh, people of color. I suspect many of you have experienced those microaggressions or, or macro aggressions, uh, racialized aggressions uh, in society. I myself have, have experienced those, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the United States. And, but it's not just isolated to the US. Uh, the introductory conversation was about caste and, and about the discrimination that even occurs to this day in the United States based on an approach that socially stratifies people by um, things that have nothing to do with who they are as people, but rather with who they were um, born. So today we're gonna talk about California's Prop 16, um, using the ballot box to increase equity and access. So let's go all the way back to 1996. And I remember when Ward Connerly was on his tour um, trying to pass uh, ballot propositions. Some states, of course, California being one of the ones that has many of these. And I remember when I lived in California, you know, there's like 15 ballot propositions every single time. And you're trying to, what is exactly this trying to say? Um, and so at the time, the proposition was, wow, we want everybody to treat, be treated equally. Um, but essentially what it did was it prevented governmental institutions from considering people's backgrounds, um, and when, when decisions are being made about education and other things, which to me doesn't make much sense because that's part of what makes us unique um, as individuals. So let's go to some of the bigger picture issues. I mean, we, we know what the elephant in the room is in the United States. It's that, unfortunately, um, the nicer house you buy, the nicer public school you get. Um, in, if, if you're in Berkeley, uh, you know, the nicer schools uh, or Oakland, the nicer schools are in the hills. Um, you know, there are certain cities uh, that are Palo Alto compared to East Palo Alto. Those are divided by the highway. So on the other side of the highway, the other side of the hills, the other side of the river, in every single city, our country has divided uh, educational opportunities uh, by income. And that's on purpose. It's not by mistake. Um, that it's happening that way. It's, it's the elephant in the room in the United States that just like the caste system in, in or similar to the caste system, I don't want to say just, that humans have sought to stratify themselves by race and by class. Um, and what does that mean in practical terms? Uh, and I didn't put all of the citations. I'll try to give you the citations for this information as we go through the talk. Um, if I forget a citation, please let me know and I'll, I'll give you the citation. But Ed Build's recent study found that there's a $23 billion difference between school districts that serve majority people of color and school districts that serve majority white students. $23 billion. And as we talked about, we know that that disparity of $23 billion is on purpose. It's on purpose. We, we, we know that it's functioning. We know that it's happening, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about the demographics of California. So California is one of the most uh, racially and ethnically diverse um, um, states in the nation, as you know. Um, it's uh, among the student population, 
um, 47 percent of students uh, that are school age are uh, Hispanic and Latino. Um, you can see that Asian American is about 12.7%. Uh, um, white students are about 29.2%. And so what you see from this pie chart is that California, um, in terms of uh, um, uh, school age children, is majority quote unquote minority, which is now kind of, that term's kind of like an oxymoron now because uh, students of color are no longer the minority, they're actually uh, the majority. But so we were talking about uh, inequality uh, in our society. What does that inequality look like in terms of students um, that uh, are of low SES? What's interesting is that in California, um, Asian Americans, the lowest percentage of students in terms of poverty are Asian Americans. I think that, that is a real accomplishment for uh, the Asian American community, about 10.3% of Asian American students um, live in poverty, about 12% of whites, 20% uh, of African Americans, 17% of Latinx students, and 20% of, of Native Americans. Uh, so you can see that um, uh, the data shows that uh, Asian Americans in California um, uh, have the lowest uh, SES of all students. But the overall percentage of students living in poverty is 58%. So that last number, um, was uh, those numbers aren't going to add up to 58%, obviously, because those are percents of totals. But of the total students in California, 58% live in poverty. And across the nation, a majority of public school children in 17 states um, were low-income students eligible for free and reduced lunches. And that's from the National Opportunity to Learn um, Coalition. What kind of schools are these students going to? Um, before they apply to Berkeley, before they apply to Cal State Sacramento. Um, well, one of the things we know is that students of color are attending intensely segregated minority, uh, minority schools. And this is by city in, in California. This is data that I pulled for a study that I actually did on charter schools um, from the US Common Core data, which is uh, the data set that the US Department of Education keeps. So this shows you um, what percentage of students go to highly segregated schools. Those are schools that are 90% or more uh, students of color. And so you can see some districts like Inglewood, California, 100% of, of students of color attend highly segregated schools. You can see LA, Oakland, Stockton, San Jose, et cetera. And so the context within which students of color, they're attending these poorly funded schools that are primarily students of color. But then there's a question about access to higher education. Now this particular table I included here because I want you to understand also the history uh, for, for Latinx students, for African American students. My own family um, has been in the United States for uh, probably 150 years or more um, on, on both sides of my family. My, my grandmother uh, who was a Mexican-American from Texas would always say that the uh, border crossed them. They didn't cross the border. They were living in Texas before it was Texas. Um, and so, uh, you know, lat lat Latinos and African-Americans have um, uh, wanted access to higher education specifically uh, for quite some time. And so I wanted to ask the question, because they didn't start to collect racial ethnic data um, until after the civil rights movements in the 1960s. So we don't really have data that goes back farther than the early 1970s, late 1960s um, for race and ethnicity in higher education. So we wanted to take a look at, what if you look at a, at a university and you go back a hundred years or almost a hundred years, what, what does that enrollment look like for communities who have been in the United States for a very long time? Um, well, we know that until the 1950s, that African Americans weren't even allowed to attend colleges and universities uh, that um, had white students. So you see uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, which is comparable to like a UCLA or a uh, UC Berkeley, that for a very long time, African Americans relative to their population were severely underrepresented. 
um, you can see uh, even in 1937, about 1% of Latinos. Now, we didn't do the same um, study at because the study's from about six or seven years ago. We didn't do the same data for, for Asian Americans, unfortunately. Um, but you can see that for a long, long time, not only until recently, have you seen uh, large populations of students uh, from African American and Latino backgrounds being allowed access into higher education. And you don't start to see those percentages go up until the 1980s. So it has not been very long that African Americans and Latinos have had wider spread access. And in the case of African Americans, the access is still quite quite limited, as you can see in this table. So let's talk about the UCs. You know, affirmative action doesn't really affect most colleges and universities because most colleges and universities are primarily or almost open enrollment. And so what that means is, is that if you want to go to Cal State Long Beach, let's say, um, there's a pretty good chance that you'll be able to go because it's almost uh, open enrollment or Cal State. So where affirmative action really comes into play is the more selective colleges and universities, which really there aren't that many. Um, you know, you could think there's probably less than 50. I, I don't know the exact number, but not that many. Um, you know, most colleges and universities uh, are looking for enrollment and their admissions policies are pretty flexible. But the UC system, as you know, um, is one of the gems of the world. And so it's a highly selective admissions process. And so you can see here over time, uh, what has happened after Proposition um, um, 209, uh, at the very bottom, you can see that African-American enrollment has remained about between 1% and 2% across the entire UC system. That's a problem. Um, I think it's a problem when you see a number like this, where you have African-Americans being about 5 6%, 5 or 6%. Now you have Latinos, their, their, their rate is growing uh, and they're at about a little over 20%. But if you think about the students in California, um, almost half of students are, um, are uh, Latino. So, you, so when we talk about underrepresented, that's what that means. You have 20% of students in, in UCs being from uh, Hispanic Latinos, but you have 50% of the students are, are from that background. Uh, and the same, same for African-Americans. And on the right, you can see California residents, male, female, um, URMs about 20%, um, et cetera. Um, then you can see here what UCLA looks like. You can see that the uh, Hispanic Latino population is lower than the overall UC. So of course, you know, you. You have more Latino students at some of the other UC campuses, the San Diego's, the Irvine's, et cetera, um, as compared to uh, uh, one of the flagships. You know, I mean, it's, it's arguably um, UCLA and, and Berkeley are the flagships, but Irvine might have something to say about that, but that's for another day. Um, so you can see African-American enrollment uh, at the very bottom here, also at a, still about between one and 2%. Uh, Berkeley, same situation, uh, very similar to what you see um, with um, with um, uh, uh, UCLA. Now, I think another thing to bring into play here is that um, when we're talking about education, it also impacts um, hiring of professors of color. It also impacts hiring teachers of color um, because uh, according to 209, you can't consider a person's background uh, race, um, sex, et cetera, gender, um, you, you, that, that can be a part of, of what's being considered. But we know, and this is some national data from a study that we looked at last year, that um, across the nation, that there is a severe dearth of scholars of color. Um, so you can see here that, and, and by gender too, 67% of professors are men, 32% are women. You can see that Native Americans, it's one third of a percent. For Asian Americans, it's 12%. Um, you see for African Americans, it's about 4%, and that compares to a national population of 12% of or more. Uh, Latinos are at 4%. They're probably the most, one of the most upper represented groups relative to their population in the United States. Um, you see Native Hawaiian, uh, white is about 75% of, of professors. And so when universities like UC or Cal State, uh, you know, you have um, uh, campuses like Cal State that are primarily students of color and the faculty are primarily white. Um, that's just the data. 
Um, that's just the data. So even though the majority of the students are Asian American, they're African American, they're Latinx, when universities are, 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 are hiring, they can't consider a person's gender, they can't consider a person's race, even though the, the students, for example, that Cal State serving is 60 to 70 percent students of color and, and the professors are basically, uh, the statistics show exactly the transverse of that. So what is, what is uh, Prop 16 does? And I, I grabbed this from online. It allows diversity as a factor in employment, education, contracting decisions. Um, uh, it's a constitutional amendment and it permits um, decision-making to include these factors amongst others, which aligns with what the Supreme Court has said you know, Bloom, you were, they were talking a little bit about the Harvard case. Well, before that, he was at Texas saying that Abigail Fisher um, was uh, not qualified. Uh, but it turned out that there were, I don't know, don't quote me on the exact number, a little under 100 African-American and Latino students who had better test scores and a better GPA than Abigail Fisher that were actually rejected um, to UT Austin. So that case failed. Uh, in the U.S. Supreme Court, and these cases continue to fail. But the latest angle is is an old political approach, which is divide and conquer. You want to, on your side, you want to um, unite. On the other side of the conversation, you want to divide. So their strategy is now essentially uh, to make the case uh, to Asian Americans that they 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 shouldn't um, um, uh, consider all the factors. Um, when, when we're thinking about um, education, especially selective education. Um, and so Prop 16 allows uh, uh, that consideration to, uh, to, to return. Uh, it's not, you know, the Supreme Court has already ruled that it cannot be an overwhelming factor. It can only be a plus, that it has to be amongst many other factors. But as it is now, if you apply to the University of California, they can't uh, take into account um, the situation that you grew up in as an African American or as a, as a Latino or as a Filipina or as an Indian American, that is completely wiped from um, uh, what's uh, being considered. So um, there are many other state and federal laws that guarantee equal protection under the Constitution and prohibit unlawful discrimination. So essentially what Prop 16 does is it repeals um, 209 and allows gender um, and race to be one of many factors in considerations uh, in, in, in education. Uh, and that concludes. Um, I guess I th the final sort of thought here is that, you know, education, it empowers Americans as seekers and speakers of truth. And that's why it's so important that all communities, uh, especially historically marginalized communities, communities in which our society is underserving them on purpose, in which their schools are underfunded. Uh, it's important that we educate folks from all communities uh, because those individuals um, will be important seekers and speakers of truth within those communities and within our nation. Thank you. And also, the only way to build the equal society is by building a, a diverse campuses. And I'd like to stop here and I'd like to uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Vaza Kaling to give his um, concluding remark on, on, on his speech and presentation and uh, why Prop 16 that we had to vote yes and further additions on that. Well, I, I don't have a political position on Prop 16. So let me just say that, um, you know, as, as an academic and as a dean, uh, specifically, um, you know, I don't, I don't endorse candidates or, or propositions. Um, uh, as a faculty member, I did that, but as dean, um, we, it's just recommended we don't. Um, but I think that what proposition, looking at my own research, and thinking about the context within which um, we want students to live, uh, and the context within which we want students to be educated. Uh, diverse context where folks and uh, where students from all different backgrounds can come together and make a better nation. Um, I think that considering the entire background of, of students when we're thinking, and again, remember I'm underscoring uh, affirmative action and, and considering, you know, gender as a, as a factor in, in admissions, 
that, that only comes into play when we're talking about schools like the UCs or like, um, um, like, a, like a, uh, a MIT or a Caltech, that kind of thing. Um, Cal States and, and, and most other universities are wide open uh, in most cases uh, for students um, to attend. Uh, like San Diego State, you know, is a little more difficult to get into. But um, so this only applies to a very small number of schools where we want to make sure that they have an environment that is diverse and equitable and, and inclusive, uh, and that we have professors that are diverse, equitable, uh, and, and inclusive. And so, um, use, again, there is never a situation where two candidates are equally qualified for a position. It's just impossible. Um, and so what we're talking about here is not ignoring the fact that someone grew up in a particular community or culture or, or background, and that just being one of many factors um, uh, being considered um, when you uh, um, apply to uh, one of these types of institutions. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thanks for your time. Thank you. I hope you all have a great Saturday and please reach out to me on Twitter, uh, Professor JVH, JVH, or, and feel free to add me on LinkedIn um, or, or Facebook if you so choose. Thank you.